Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual Bible study class. As you can tell by now, this Bible study is pre-recorded, and I chose to pre-record it because I wanted to begin our December studies on time without having to backtrack to finish the uh, the series, to, fin to complete the series on loving and celebrating myself. And so, um, so hopefully you'll watch this video in its entirety and catch the, the three week study in December, which begins tomorrow night, Tuesday night. I don't know when you're watching this video, but anyway, let's begin with the word of prayer. Plan in the background is Tamla man, change me, oh God. That's what we're talking about tonight. Choosing to grow and to be productive and choosing um, spiritual maturity and positivity and we can't do that unless we have a clean heart unless we've been changed and transformed by the power of God we want to be changed so that we can give God a pure praise and a worship that is acceptable to him we need him to change us father God right now in the name of Jesus how we thank you Lord God for just another opportunity to Join together, albeit in our private spaces in, uh, in this virtual space to study together. Um, we're grateful, God. We're grateful for how you can uh, join our hearts and our minds together and, and grateful for how you can speak your word to us and meet each of us where we are. And so I pray tonight, Lord God, that you would just uh, speak through me tonight the words that you would have us to hear. I pray that whomever would see this video, whomever would watch this video, wherever they are, whatever they're experiencing, whatever pressure they're under, whatever challenges they're facing, that even through this study, they may hear that you love them. And because of your great love, you would never leave them alone. In fact, you're right there where they are to provide and supply every need. And so I pray that you just allow your people to hear your voice, to sense your presence, and to be sure of your promise and your presence with them. We love you. We thank you. We pray that you would just uh, enlighten us, open up the eyes of our understanding, and enlighten us with your truth tonight, so that not only are we able to hear your word, but we're able to see us through your word, Father. Speak to us tonight is my prayer, and I pray this prayer by faith in daughter, son, Jesus' name, amen, and thank God. So thank you all for being faithful and committed to this class. We missed the last two weeks of Thanksgiving, and so we're right back here um, to finish up this study, loving and celebrating myself. And so we just talked about, I think two or three weeks, we just talked about the importance of loving self, the importance of having a healthy self-esteem, the importance of having a proper perspective of who you are. And uh, we looked at the psalmist words in Psalm number four, well, Psalm number eight, I'm sorry, when the Bible says that um, uh, God has created us a little lower than the angels and he's crowned us with his glory and honor. God loves us and there's not one other creation that is greater than the creation of humankind. God loves us. We're the only created thing that was created in his image and after his likeness. And for that reason, we are to give God praise and we're, we are to give God glory. We are to give God honor. And the way we best do that is by giving God our self. That we give God our self and giving God our best self is the best praise that you can render to him, giving God your best self. And so we talked about some human facts, some facts that are 
some fun facts about uh, ourselves, some fun facts about God's creation and sharing those facts. It was my desire that we could see just how unique we are, that uh, although the armadillo has a, a body that cannot be penetrated by a bullet, although it takes two years for a, a, a one pineapple to grow, although a Niagara Falls never freezes, although the earth is traveling 67 uh, miles per hour, uh, that quickly, that, that swiftly, um, although we have these unique facts about earth and by God's creation, there is nothing more miraculous, nothing more uh, great than humankind. We are the best thing that God created. And so, uh, and, and because God created you and made you unique that, um, 99% of all humans have everything alike. Uh, it's just 1% of us that makes us different. And because of that 1%, you are uniquely authentic, authentically you, and God wants you to love you and embrace you um, uh, for being you and, and not allowing anybody to devalue you, to make you feel less about you, um, that you learn to love you and see you the way God sees you. We talked about God is mindful of us, that God always has us on his mind. Yes, he sees our uh, uh, weaknesses. He sees our flaws. He knows how weak we are. He knows how frail we are. He knows how finite we are. And yet God always has us on his mind. And because he has us on his mind, we can be confident that he will take care of our needs, that he will take care of us spiritually, financially, physically, emotionally, everything, socially, relationally, whatever it is we need, God is with us and he's mindful of us to help us and to um, provide for us what is beyond our power to provide and to do for ourselves. And so um, it's important, again, it's important for us to keep reading and studying the word of God. I, I said to you more than one time that studying about self and, and self-love is not to make us narcissistic or to make us self-centered or self-absorbed or self-seeking or self-serving, but, um, but to teach on Self-love is a way for us to understand that there's no way we could properly love others or even really love ourselves until we first are able to see ourselves the way God sees us. And even with all of our flaws, God loves us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So if there was nobody else in the world but me, God would have died for me because he loves me just that much. And he loves you just that much. And so uh, when we are able to love ourselves the way God loves us, loves us, then it's easy for us to accept other people to be who they are and accept other, other people for who they are, who they are not, um, uh, because we don't expect, we no longer expect people to be perfect because we're not perfect. We're imperfect. We don't expect other people to be sinless because we're not sinless. And so, um, and so self-love is necessary. The Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so, um, uh, loving others flows from a healthy self-love and, um, uh, so when we talk about self-love and having a self-esteem, we're talking about coming to know who God is, coming to know who God is because God is love. And because God is love, he would teach us how to love, teach us um, how to love properly, teach us how to protect our love. We talked about uh, when, 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 when we don't have a healthy self-esteem that we would uh, go out of our way to try to please other people and, and to become people pleasing is not the will of God because the scripture says that God created us for his glory. And so we don't want to um, um, uh, think so lowly of ourselves that we give up what we think, what we want, what we feel because we want to please other people and because we want to get along with other people. Yes, there, there is a need for us to uh, live with others and to get along with others. Um, but the way we best do that is first of all, self um, differentiation, know who I am and know what I bring to the table. I said to you more than one time that there's no I in team, but there is a me in team. And so we are better when we first understand who we are individually. That when we understand and love who we are as individuals, then we can properly love others and become a asset and a strength to a, a to to um to others outside of our, ourselves or to others alongside ourselves we talked about Gideon how he thought he was too weak that uh he complained about being the lesser of the of 
or less of anybody, his family coming from an insignificant family, but God called him a mighty man of valor. We talked about Jeremiah, when God called him and told him, I uh, ordained you a prophet to the nations. I knew you before you reformed your mother's belly. Jeremiah thought he was too young. We talked about the centurion who, although he was correct, he had a son who was at home sick, and he was correct to say that he was not worthy for Jesus to come under his roof, but because of his faith, the Lord did exactly what he wanted. He healed his son without even even coming in his house, but the centurion, uh, the centurion saw himself as being unworthy. And I said to you, apart from Jesus Christ, we are unworthy. It is because of our relationship with him. It's because of our relationship uh, being saved that we can now say that 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 um uh that that I'm that I'm significant. And let me not say it like that because everybody matters, whether you're saved or unsaved. Uh, everybody matters, but uh, what I want us to understand is that we are, um, we don't deserve, maybe that's what I should say, we don't deserve God's blessings, we don't deserve God's goodness, and the fact that we are recipients of God's blessings and recipients of God's goodness is because we are in relationship with him, because he loves us, it is not because of us, it's, it's because of his mercies that we're not consumed, it's because his compassions fail not. It's because of who he is and not because of who we are. We don't deserve anything. The Bible says all of our righteousness is, is stinks in the nostrils of God. All of our all of our righteousness is as filthy rags and we stink in the nostrils of God. And so uh and so recognizing that um I'm not important in and of myself. I'm important because God created me because God said I am, because God said I'm good. And it's not because of my own merit or not because of something that I've done to make me good. It's because God created me and he said I'm very good. We talked about the Samaritan woman who felt who, who felt rejected, uh, was re in relationship after relationship, and she was rejected by these other men or, or these other relationships ended, was se was severed, uh, it divorced, and she was shacking up with somebody who the Lord told her was not, was not even her husband. So, but this woman, once she had an encounter with Jesus Christ, once she had an encounter with the real man, she was able to be introduced to what love is, be introduced to who she is and what she deserves, so much so that she went back to Samaria, went back to her hometown to tell the other people, come see a man who told me everything I ever knew, who told me all about myself. And so um, and so these past weeks, we've just tried to help us to understand that there are many people in the Bible who, who felt like we feel, who experienced what we experienced, and yet God used them. When they had an encounter with Jesus, their lives changed. And that's what I want us to understand that it doesn't matter what side of the track we were born on. It doesn't matter if you were if you were if you were reared in a broken home by a drug addicted parents or or absent parent or abusive parent. It doesn't matter where you have come from, from where you have come. The fact that God created you and that and the fact that God is ultimately the one who is responsible for your life. You can recover. You can uh, have a better life. You can have uh, the the type of of, of life that you desire when you learn self love you it, when you love yourself enough to forgive the people who hurt you love yourself enough to move beyond the past and embrace your present and believe God for a glorious future so we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I know oh, I always go too long when I try to uh, recapitulate or or um rehearse or do a summary of what we learned in the past, but it's important that we do because somebody may not have been a part of the class from the beginning. So I just want you to be uh, caught up to where we are. And so we talked about massive hierarchy of needs that every human being has these physiological needs for safety, for food, for, for water, that everybody has a need for security. Everybody has a need uh, to feel like they belong. We have a need for a relationship. And so you're not wrong to feel um, like you need somebody, not need in the sense that you can't do without, but need in the sense that we were created for a relationship. God created us for relationships. And so there's nothing wrong with uh, wanting to have friendships and relationships, whether they platonic or romantic, we were created for each other. We were created to belong. And so um, and so what Maslow hierarchy needs to suggest to us is that we would never reach our epitome. We would never get to uh, self-actualization. We would never get to the point of being our best self if we have not um, had these 
basic fundamental needs met. Um, that's that achieving my full potential or my highest goals or my greatest, uh, 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 my greatest happens when I have had those other needs met, like the esteem needs, the belonging needs, the safety needs, and the physiological needs. And I said to you that uh, we can't we can't change how we were raised. We can't change what happened in our childhood. We can't change how our parents or somebody. Uh, treat us as we were growing up. But the word of God tells us when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What is that mean? What does that mean? That means that once I get to this point of accountability or a certain age of accountability that I, re I take responsibility for my own life. I cannot change the past, but what I can do is take responsibility for my life, my choices, my decisions, and choose that I'm not going to allow my past to cause me to forfeit on the future that God wants me to have. And so uh, that's what we talked about tonight, that we have to choose to be productive. We have to choose to be positive. We have to choose to keep growing. We have to. Uh, we have to. We have to deny and to and defy this Peter Pan syndrome that um, that suggests that I, I I remain in this immature state of being. That I stay in this place where I expect other people to take care of me. I expect other people to always uh, coddle me and 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 and. Uh, 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 rub me and uh, uh, stroke me and make me feel good about me. We've got to grow up. Peter Pan, we know Peter Pan, I talked about Peter Pan, this Peter Pan syndrome, this uh, Walt Disney character sang the song, I won't grow up, I would never even try. If growing up means it would be beneath my dignity to climb a tree, I won't grow up, I won't grow up, not me. Well, Peter Pan, he, he chose to stay in Neverland rather than grow up because he wanted to keep doing childish things. And uh, when we look at Peter Pan more, more closely, we were able to see that at least he was mature enough to recognize that at a certain level, at a certain age, there are some things that you should no longer do. And at the same time, there are some things you should do that maturity and, and numerical growth suggests that you are becoming more and more independent, that you're, you take responsibility and accountability for your own action, that you're learning to take care of yourself, to do for yourself. And it would seem senseless that we'd have to have these type of Bible studies with grown people. But the truth is there are a lot of grown people who are old in age, who are mature in age, but are immature uh, in caring for themselves, immature in taking responsibility for their own life, immature when it comes to uh, the spiritual things. Um, and so we've got to learn that the word of God is, is, is tailored for us. The word of God is tailored to teach us that it's not just enough for us to be saved, but God wants us to grow from faith to faith and from glory to glory. That's the reason we work, read the word of God, because the word of God teaches us. It helps us. It's spiritual food. It's nourishment for our spiritual selves to help us to grow up. The Bible says, I think in Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Hebrew writer said, in a time when you ought to be teachers, you, uh, you still need somebody to teach you because you're still stuck on the elementary things. You're still stuck on, should we wear pants at church? Should women preach? We're still stuck on, who does God love? Does God love everybody? We're still stuck on the elementary things, the, uh, uh, the things that we should have, uh, have uh, gotten over by now. Uh, and and we at some point we should get to the point where we understand that God loves us all, and that's not one person who means more to God than the next person. That we all have our uh, weaknesses, our flaws, our vices. We all have things in our life that 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 are. Uh, that God has to help us with. Um, but we, we've got to grow up so that we're not judging each other, that we're not downing one another, that we're not throwing shade on one another, that we're not coming out um, uh, hating on, on each other because we're different. Uh, 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 and because somebody is not as mature as you are in, a, in an area, because the truth is none of us are where we should be. All of us are still growing. All of us are working prior progress. And so um and so we talk about these Maslow hierarchy needs and getting to the place where we can fully mature and be our best self. That's not that's not to ever suggest that we would ever not have sin and never come to the point where we don't need to grow. As long as we are alive, there's going to be some area of our life where we can be better. But at the same time, we want to love ourselves and understand that uh, I've got to celebrate my successes and, and not beat myself up, 
up over my failures, over my flaws, that I learn to love me. And as I love me and embrace me, I'm also able to love other people and help them. And so we don't want to be like Peter Pan ref refusing to grow up. We And um, I said to you on more than one occasion that talking about self-love is not to suggest that uh, we become self-absorbed or self focus or self-serving or self-centered uh, or or not narcissistic not at all uh, it's to help us understand balance help us to understand uh how god wants us to operate as individuals and as the body of christ um because the world teaches us to do it for yourself uh you don't need anybody else if they're not on your level cut them off leave them alone uh you, you know that's that's the world's way we the world teaches us about um canceling people. Uh, but that's not what the word of God teaches us. The word of God teaches us to embrace one another, to hide a multitude of, of false or the sins of other people that allow our love to cover them, to help them, to, to, to nurture them, to bear under them. The Bible says the strong must bear the infirmities of the weak. And so uh, as we grow in God, the more mature we become, we're able to take responsibility for our own actions, forgive people for how they've hurt us or tried to stymie us or, 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 or to delay us or to defraud us, to hurt us, or to minimize, criticize, ostracize, whatever somebody has done to try to hurt you. Maturity says, but I choose to be positive. I choose to be productive. I choose to keep on growing. We get that? And so, so that's where we are tonight, choosing growth. And so how do we choose growth? What I want to say to you, first of all, to choose growth means to know yourself, know yourself, know what you're good at, know what you need to improve upon, know, um, know yourself. You would never come to know yourself if you don't spend adequate time with yourself. And some of us are afraid to be alone. We jump from relationship to relationship, from bed to bed, from person to person, looking for somebody to affirm us, to make us feel good about ourselves, to stroke us. That is so immature. Baby cries to be healed. But as you grow, you learn to learn. You learn you've got to learn to love yourself. Uh, 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 think about your likes and your dislikes. Think about where you want to go. Think about, you know, why you haven't been moving. Th you know, spend time to love yourself, to get to know yourself. Who are you? I mean, who are you really? Who do you aspire to be? Always remember to be yourself and to focus on yourself and what you want so that you won't conform to what somebody else wants. I need to say that again. Let me say it like this. One of my favorite quotes in the entire world is um, uh, um, to be nobody but yourself in a world that is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else means to fight the hardest battle you've ever had to fight and keep on fighting. E.E. E. Cummings said that. You've got the hardest fight in life is not to get to the top, is not to get money. The hardest fight in life is to learn to love yourself, to be yourself. Just be yourself, be yourself and love who you are, be comfortable in your own skin. Uh, that's how you choose, grow. Be comfortable with your own skin, in your own skin. If they don't like you, you know, how many days are you going to cry because somebody don't like you, because somebody rejected you, because somebody didn't hire you, because somebody didn't include you, because somebody's not celebrating you? How long are you going to waste time on what somebody else thinks or what somebody else feels or what somebody else wants or what somebody else desires? You've got to choose to be positive about you. You've got to choose to love you. You've got to choose to be productive despite all of the counterproductive things that may happen to you. You've got to know yourself. Look, it is better to be hated for who you are than it is to be loved for something you are not. Let me say that again. I don't know who said this, but it is better to be hated for who you are than it is to be loved for something you are not. So I'd rather for somebody to hate me and I'm being me, that somebody love me and I'm not who I'm portraying or who I'm not uh, projecting or who I'm not uh, camouflaging or pretending to be. When you go home at night, when you get in your own bed, when, you, when you're in your own space, you know who you are. And if you can't be that person around everybody all the time, there is something wrong with your level of maturity. You've got to grow up and embrace who you are. There, You know, there's nothing more um, 
sad to me that to see a person when they are in the company of somebody else, they change the way they talk, they change the way they act. And I'm looking like, what the hell? I mean, certain people come around and we, and we every word we say have an R in it because we're trying to be proper. Or, 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 well, be who you are. Be who you are. Be comfortable who you are. I don't care what color they are. I don't care how many digits behind their name, how many letters in front of their name, how many coming out certificates and degrees they have on the wall, how many dollar signs. I don't care what class that. I don't care who they are. Be who you are with ev wherever you are, with whomever you are with. You got to love yourself enough to be who you are. Amen, somebody. I hope I'm making sense to you. Then cho choosing growth means to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, you may have never tried it. You may have never liked it. Um, but if you're going to grow, you got to try something new. You, you can't be afraid to explore. You can't be afraid of adventure. You will never grow if you never try something new. You'll never know what you can do if you never try. I hate to people say, I don't like it. Have you tried it? No, I don't have to try it. I just don't like it. That's foolish. You, I mean, you have to try anything, but how can you ever grow and expand and become your best you if you are afraid of getting out of your comfort zone? You've got to uh, 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 stop resting on your rusty, dusty, do nothing and get up and live life. Get up and explore. Get up and be adventurous. Not saying that, uh, you know, if you're an introvert, not saying that you now all of a sudden have to be extrovert to for growth. No, I'm just saying be who you are. But then God has created this whole world for us to enjoy. God has put so much here for us to be a part of, for us to see, for us to do, for us to uh, uh, plant our food. Feet. But if we if we too stuck in our comfort zone, then we would never come to realize our greatness. We would never see um, all that God wants us to see. Develop a thick skin. This is just review. Develop a thick skin. Somebody's not going to like you. Somebody's not going to speak to you. Somebody's not going to speak well of you. That's okay. You got to allow, you got to allow people's criticism. You've got to allow people's judgment to roll off your back like water off a duck's back. Roll off you like water off a duck's back. Amen, somebody. Um, well, develop a thick skin. You can't cry about everything. Then learn to assert yourself. I don't think I, I don't think I said this the last time. Learn to assert yourself. In life, we often go through tough situations. All of us will have tough situations. But one of the most important skills that you and I will ever uh, uh, learn that you and I would ever need to learn is how to how to assert ourselves. That means standing up for yourself. That means making your feelings known so other people can hear your voice. Let me say that again. You got to you got to make your feelings known. Don't just sit in a room and never give your opinion. Never say how you feel. Never interject. Never be a part of the conversation. Assert yourself. If you in the room, let other people know you're in the room. Doesn't mean that you have to be loud and come on now overbearing and uh you know just kind of smother everybody or choke the life out of everybody because you're just so overpowering no it just means if you're in the room if you if you're in the room be a part of be a part of the room are y'all hearing me so be a part of the conversation it's okay to talk it's okay to say how you feel and many times i think we don't do that because we want people uh to like us and so maybe i won't say anything if i don't think just like them then i'm not going to say anything well that's foolish you don't have to think like them. Amen, somebody. They don't have to think like you. But if you're in a room, you've got to assert yourself. Allow somebody else to get to know the real you and be okay with who you are. Make your feelings known. Help, help people to hear your voices, to see who you are. Amen, somebody. Make, make your needs a priority. Let me say that again. You got to make your needs a priority. If you don't make yourself a priority, then, then you will never become somebody else's priority. Then people will always step over you and you will find yourself living their dream. You will find yourself uh, making their ministry work or making their goals come to pass. You will find yourself, you know, being a servant in somebody else's situation. And what, uh, uh, and to be a servant, um, it's not, um, I don't want to just go so fast, just be talking all over the place. Um, 
God wants us to have a servant attitude where, where, where we don't think anything is too small, no task is too small or too little, or something too beneath me to do. God wants me to have the mindset that I'm able to serve people, that I'm able to love people, that I'm able to be there for people, I'm able to give myself to others, I'm able to be self uh, uh, to, uh, to sacrifice so that I can help somebody else. But God, in doing Doing that, God does not want me to lose myself while I'm serving others. Do you get that? God doesn't want me to lose myself to serve others. There is no servant on earth. Nobody was a greater servant than Jesus. And Jesus is the savior of the world. So Jesus was king. He was Lord. He was God in the flesh. And yet he served. He did not lose his identity in serving. It didn't take anything from Jesus to take the towel from around his waist and wash his disciples' feet. He did that. Why? Because he knew who he was. In the book of John, he says, I know who I am. I know from whom I've come and I know where I'm going. And he said to the father, I have lost none that you have given me none. And so what Jesus was literally saying, because I know who I am, because I know I came from God and I'm going back to God. I know I am God. I don't have a problem serving people. I don't have a problem coming out getting on their level. I don't have a problem meeting people where they are because I know who I am. It doesn't take anything for me to bow down to somebody else. Uh, but but understand, servitude does not mean losing my identity. In fact, you're not really able to serve until you first of all know who you are. So when a person knows who they are, they don't have a problem working at Wendy's. When a person knows who they are, they don't have a problem sitting you know, in the back of the plane. Come on, y'all. It's people who have a problem with their identity that, have, that find it uh, uh, beneath them to serve, beneath them to sit and coach. Hello, somebody. You are, When you know you first class, you can sit anywhere. When you know that you are a person of importance, you can work anywhere. Amen, somebody, because a title doesn't make you. Where you stand it geographically doesn't make you. Where you sit in locationally doesn't make you. The position doesn't make you. When you know who you are, you don't define yourself by pretentious things, by designer clothes or red bottom shoes or high dollar tags. You know who you are. For, and you can have on something from Target, from Walmart. Hello, somebody. You can make your own garments and wear them like, come on now. A designer original because you are a designer original. God designed you and there's nobody like you. And so assert yourself, assert yourself, make yourself a priority. Not that you're better than anybody else, but understand that nobody else is better than you. There are no big eyes. There are no little you's. We all walk on the same level plane. We all have to take in the same oxygen for life. Amen, somebody. And so uh, learn to assert yourself. Don't ever be in a place where you feel lesser than somebody else. That's not the will of God. And then if I'm going to choose growth, then I have to choose to adopt good habits. A habit is anything you do that, that becomes a, a, a routine for you. So we've got to learn how to adopt good habits. For some of us, we have made social media a habit. The first thing we do in the morning we, is we get on Facebook. The last thing we do at night is we get on Facebook. We're on Facebook all day long. Please, I'm not taking anything away from Facebook because if you're watching me right now, you know I'm on Facebook. I post pictures and all of that. But then I, I don't lose myself on Facebook. I don't lose myself on social media. I don't allow uh, social media to just steal my time. So we've got to make sure that if, if we're growing, that we adopt good habits. Are you being productive with your time? What in a 24 hour day? What are you doing? What are you doing to better you? What are you doing to better your situation? What are you doing to come on out to brighten your own future? You've got to develop good habits. Learn to complete tasks on time and not do everything at the last minute. Learn to keep up with the time so time is not always slipping by you. you you've got to learn to organize, learn to come on out, learn to um. Uh, to make a list so that so that you're doing what you need to do in the day and you're not allowing every day to pass and you're not getting done the things that you need to get done. So it's okay to develop a list, to have a, a priority list, a things to do list so, so that you're not just taking on stuff that you were not supposed to do and at the end of the day, you haven't done anything that God committed to you to do. So you got to develop good habits. Choosing growth means 
that you that you uh that you not only assert yourself that you that you not only know yourself that you not only get out of your comfort zone that you not only develop a thick skin but it also means to create a plan and goals for your life come on y'all part of spiritual development is having plans Listen, y'all, um, Christianity doesn't mean just, faith doesn't mean that you just, you just shoot, shoot in the dark, that you just, uh, that you just living by chance or happenstance. No, that's not what faith is at all. Everything that Jesus did, he did on time. The Bible says before he sent the Holy Spirit, it was when the day of Pentecost was fully come, when in the fullness of time, when, when it was when Jesus would you, before Jesus came, it was prophesied how he was going to come, where he was going to come. Everything Jesus did, he did it on time. That was a plan. He was in God's plan. And, and likewise, we've got to develop a plan. You got to have a plan for your life, a plan for your finances, a plan for your children, a plan for your marriage, a plan for your career. You got to have a plan. The Bible says if, if you don't plan, uh, if, if you have a plan that God will help those plans come to pass. Are y'all listen? Listen to me. The the word teaches us that we develop to, to develop a plan, that we commit our works to Him. Listen. So the word of God doesn't teach us just to get up and whatever the Lord wants me to do now, I'll just do it as if I don't have a plan, as a, as if I don't have a say. No, the Bible says if you when you have a plan, just know that God is the one who's going to give it the answer. God's the one. God is the one who's going to help bring it to pass. But then you got to have a plan. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct, direct your path. God will direct our path, but that's not suggest that we that's not to suggest that we don't have a plan, that, that we're not walking, that we're not, we don't have a plan to progress, a plan to proceed, a plan to come on y'all to, to, to succeed. So you have to create a plan. Uh, when I, the, the one of the first things I learned in college, I, I don't remember which college professor I was on the campus of TSU, just afraid. I left, hit, finished high school and here you are in uh, this big old campus and they give you a syllabus and tell you what's expected and, and they don't talk about it anymore until it's due. You're like, wait a minute, nobody told me that it was good. Well, th that was the difference between my high school teacher and the college professor. The college pr professor is not going to remind you every day you have homework. They're not going to remind you every day that you're going to have a test. They're not going to remind you of that every day because as you grow, you mature, even on your educational path, they expect that you have that you take responsibility and you have some accountability for for your desire to attain a degree. And so my, my, my professor said, proper planning prevents poor performance. And she said over and over again, proper planning prevents poor performance. You got to plan. You, you got to have a plan. Have a plan to pass this test. Have a plan to finish this course. Have a plan. And, we, and you have a plan. Make sure that you that you executed that is a that, that you executed it properly. Come on, y'all. When you have when you have a plan and you properly execute that plan, then you then you can expect that that plan is going to produce the results that you wanted to produce. So, what are your ambitions? Have you stopped dreaming? Have you stopped desiring because you're sixty? Because you're retired? Who am I talking to today? As long as you have life, as long as you have breath in your lungs, as long as God is giving you life, there is something that God wants you to do. And so you got to spend time in your secret closet, spend time along with God, spend time knowing yourself, spending time with God so God can speak to you in your inner ear to speak to you what his plan is for your life so that you can be in agreement with God's plan and so that your plans can come to pass. Have a plan, five-year goal, 10-year goal. And if y'all think, well, I'm just too old doing anything. Well, even, even if all you, if you think there's nothing in your future but death, well, have you planned for death? Have you planned for that? Have you planned a medical power of attorney? Have you planned who's going to be the executive of your will? Have you planned your funeral? Have you planned what you're going to wear? I don't care what it is. We need to have a plan. As long as you're alive, you should have goals for your life. Have a plan. If not, then you're going to be the puppet in somebody else's plan. 
Choosing growth also means to be kind and to be generous. Choosing growth means that I understand that this world does not revolve around me. It's not just about me. And so because I share this planet with other people, I've got to be kind to other people. So what they're mean. So what they left their basket in the middle of the parking lot and the wind was blowing and it hit your car. Come on. I mean, we can get angry, get upset and, and, and get go, go ballistic. Uh, go go ballistic <laughs> go postal that's immature and i and i laugh and it's really not fun when we see when we see this 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 insane activity of people happy every day all day that's a sign of some immature person or some depraved mind some evil immature person who did not know how to control their own actions, who did not know how to respond to something that they didn't like, who did not know how to take responsibility and accountability for something they did or didn't do. So it's easy for them to shoot up somebody. It's easy for them to take their life. It's, it's somebody else's life. It's easy for them to rob, to steal, because they won't take responsibility. They won't be accountable for what they want, for what they need. For their, Come on now. So a part of choosing growth means that I'm kind to people, that I'm generous to other people, that, I, that I'm looking for ways to live peaceably with other people. The Bible says as much as it lies within you, be at peace with all men. That doesn't mean that they have to like me, but it does mean I have to do everything within my power to get along, to avoid a fight, to avoid coming out altercation, to avoid, to avoid trouble. So, so growth means that, um, that, I'm, not, that I'm choosing my battles. That I'm choosing, I will never forget the church that I was a part of. The very first event that I did with them was a, a, a women's retreat. We were out of town, a women's retreat. I was a guest speaker. I, I don't think I was a member of the church yet. And um, and it was a women's retreat. And, and so there were two older ladies at the retreat. And um, they the retreat was out in the woods. They were bunk beds and all that kind of stuff. You know, like it was a retreat. And so because I was a guest speaker, I had my own cabin and it, it was a queen size bed, a nice plush bed, a, a nice little room. But these two older ladies, they were upset because uh, here they are this retreat. They were upset because they had bunk beds. They had to sleep in bunk beds. And so uh, so I heard, I, I didn't know these people personally at the time. And so I heard them fussing and going at it and talking about the organizing people. They should have known all of that, all of that. And so I, I said, and I just touched them. I said, you know what I said? I have my own room. And I have this big bed. You are welcome to come and sleep in my bed. And so, uh, and so I invite these two ladies who I didn't know at the time, one of them deceased, now the other one's still alive. I love her, um, love both of them, didn't know them at the time, but I allow both of these two ladies to come to my room and to sleep in my bed, in my queen size bed, right? Because they were just, they were just upset. They were just irate because they had to sleep in these bunk beds. And so the organizers of this women retreat learned that these two ladies who happened to be even older than them were sleeping in my in my room, and they did not want that to happen because I'm the guest speaker, and they felt like it was infringement upon, you know, uh, uh, my accommodations to have them in my room. And so they came to the room, knocking on the door, and asking me all this question. I said, "Listen, I said, I invited them in, and I'm fine. I'm fine with them being in this room. Uh, and so this is not going to be a battle. This is my room, and and they are allowed to sleep in my room. And so, and so I said that to say, you got to choose." You got to choose your battles and choose your battles wisely because we want to fuss and fight over something that doesn't even matter. That even matters. So the uh, spiritual growth means if I have to be um, uncomfortable to make somebody else comfortable, this spiritual growth suggests that I would do that. Spiritual growth suggests that I would go out of my way to help somebody else. Spiritual growth, spiritual growth, uh, uh, um, uh, helps me to understand that it's not going to take anything from me to help somebody else because there's nothing to be gained from being bitter and nasty and horrible and spiteful to others. There's nothing to gain out of fighting. There's nothing to gain out of that. And so we feel the need to be vicious toward other people, to hold on to grudges, to be nasty, to be coming out to point fingers, to blame. That, that's a sign of immaturity. But spiritual growth suggests that I choose love. I choose to be kind. I choose to be generous. I choose to sacrifice. I choose to be uncomfortable to help somebody else. That's 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 growth. 
We've got to get there. What would our world look like if we thought like that all day long? If we, if we know I am a priority, but it's okay because I am a priority to put me to the side so I can help somebody else first. Yeah, that's the way I'll take care of me. Because if I could take care of you, then then, then I could get what I need. I'll never forget, this is another story. This was a long time ago. My mother and I, we were in Burlington and I was in a hurry. And there was a young girl in front of us and she was trying to buy so she didn't have enough money. And she was going back and forth. And, and I, whatever items I had, I, I was in a hurry. I don't know where I was going, but I was in a hurry. And so what I did, I just, I paid for it. I, I just said, here, let her go. And so my mom said, oh, you're so kind. She said, you always just doing good stuff for people. You're just so kind. Uh, I never would have done it because she could have put it on layaway. And I just said, well, no, nah, mom. I said, I really can't take credit for being kind. I said, I really wasn't doing it just, uh, just to give to her. I was doing it so she can get out of my way. But, but the truth is, so just to be kind to somebody else, that, that is, it will help me in the end. And so uh, spiritual growth suggests that I'm kind to other people, that I'm generous. Uh, it's a child that will hold on to all of their can. It's a child who won't share what they have. That's a, that's a child, childlike person who stingy with their stuff. God has blessed you to share. He has blessed you to share. He has blessed you to share, not so that you can hoard, not so, not that's not so that you can get bigger and bigger and greater and greater and grandi uh, uh uh so you can experience some grandiose lifestyle, but so that you can have more to give to others. Amen, somebody. And so choosing growth. I don't know how long I've been going, but let me hurry up and close this. But um, but then choosing growth means that I remember the, the simple and the most important things in life. I hear people say this all the time, and it just irks me. Uh, thank God for the little things like life, health, and strength. That's not the little things. A car is a little thing. A house is a little thing. Come on, y'all. Some, some physical Material thing is a little thing, but life is the big thing. Life is the greatest thing. So we got to remember to thank God for the for the for the great things. That's the great things. I, I thank God for the great things, and everything else is just a little thing. And so I remember that the simple, uh, I remember the simple and the most important things in life is that the big thing is life. Uh, let me say that again. Remember the simple and the most important things in life is that the big thing is life. It's easy for us to get caught up in the daily grind of life, but it's imperative to remember the important aspects of life. Life, another chance, our relationships, our friendships, those are the big things. Tripping over stuff. Listen, that's the little things. So, so when I understand the big thing is life and relationships and the and the, and the, the the things that I can't really I can't really control that I really have no power over. When I understand that that's the big things, then I could be happy about enjoying the simple things in life, like taking a walk in a park like sitting under a tree. Like I don't have to go across the waters to have a vacation. I can have a staycation. Amen. So I can have a wonderful time in my office. I can have a wonderful time at home. It's the simple things in life that can really bring you joy when you understand that the big thing is life. So you take time to just, just to share a laugh with a friend. Don't get so in a hurry that you, that you miss an opportunity just to be friendly with somebody. That's growth. Learn new skills. How long are you going to say, I don't know how to work this phone. I don't know how to do this TV. I don't know how to learn to do it. Learn how to do it. When I, uh, I would never forget uh, with social media, the first thing that came out, uh, I can't remember the first thing, but one of the young girls came to me and said, Reverend Burroughs, you need to get a Facebook page. I said, a Facebook page? I'm not doing all that. I don't want to do all that. That's too much. That's That's too much. And the young person said to me, well, if you don't get it, you're going to be out of touch. You got to learn. You got to learn. Is this, is where, this is where it's going. And so he set up the Facebook page for me. And he was working the Facebook page. And I couldn't just, if I was going to engage the young adults, I could just keep saying, well, I'm just going to have my hand out. So I'm just going to talk to him when I see him. I was not going to be able to 
to develop these young people, to minister to these young people, to communicate to these young people. I, would, I wasn't going to be able to know their language if I was going to be afraid to learn something new. You can't be afraid to learn something new. Listen, that's, that's not a thing that I do in my ministry that I can't do. Before I pay somebody else to do it, I do all that I can do first. There, there was a guy, and he may watch this video, that I would pay to do my flyers, $300 for one flyer. You know, when I when I sat down and said, you know what, I can learn how to do this. I learned how to upload videos, how to upload uh, videos and 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 and, and, and trim them and come on y'all learn how to make flyers and come on y'all you, you learn new skills you don't have to be the best at it but don't say what you can't do learn something new even if you don't become an expert in even if it's not something you want to do all the time it's okay to learn something new not that you have to do it all but it's okay to learn something new you can learn it learn a new instrument Come on now, read up, read, read, read about some subject that you don't like. Take up a new hobby. Show that you could be a well-rounded person. That's maturity. That's growth. And then finally, be happy. Be happy. Growth means I choose to be happy. And I, and I don't want to get into the technical sense of the word. We're not going to trip up over verbiage and, you know, you know, just whether it's happy or joy, however you want to look at it. Every day you can choose to be happy. Doesn't mean that everything in the day is going to be good. Everything in, in the day is going to be, you know, cause you to smile, but you can choose to be happy every day. You can choose to be happy. It's as simple as making a choice that I'm not going to allow life to get the best of me. I choose to be happy. Listen, y'all, life is far too short to live in misery. It's, life is far too short for you to live it with a pessimistic attitude, for you to live with negativity. Life is much too short for you to walk around crying and complaining because you're going to wake up one day and people who you want to be here will no longer be here. One day, you're going to wake up on the other side. Stop losing sleep and losing good days and good moments and good hours and good, come on, our good moments because you want to be sad. You got to choose to be happy. Look, I work in a hospital, y'all. You got to choose to be happy. You, you know you know how when I, I could go to a cold and I could see somebody die and before I know it, my spirit is real low but then I could go to my desk and look at look look up look up some choice to see what eight babies were born today <laughs> listen one person died but eight other babies were born this man murdered his murdered his child's mother in the front of the child that took his own life. Listen, but then there's so many other lives were saved. The whole hospital was on shutdown, lockdown, so they were safe. So I could choose to allow the news. I could choose to allow the devil to cause me to frown, to be sad, to walk around pessimistic and negative and nasty and mean and hateful and despondent and somber. And come on, I could, I could, I could choose to live my life like I've been baptized in pickle juice, sucking on lemons like the world is against me. I could choose to live like that, or I could choose to be happy. It's a choice. And so my question to you as we, as we conclude this series on loving and celebrating self, are you really growing? Are you really growing? Are you making a conscious decision to grow? Are you being intentional about your spiritual growth? You cannot grow if you're not reading the word daily. If you're not reading the word, if you're not having a prayer life and spending time with God, there is no way you're going to pray. If you spend all your time on TikTok and Instagram and social media and you're not spending time with God, spending time alone, spending time with the word, there is no way you're going to grow. Are you taking, are you taking, um, are you taking into account uh what it means to practice Christian virtues? Because being a Christian is not just a title that I hold. God wants me to grow from faith to faith and from glory to glory. He wants me to grow with the spiritual attributes. He wants me to grow in love. He wants me to grow in forgiveness. He wants me my patience to grow. He wants me to grow in long suffering. He wants me to grow. The Bible says, this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, my followers, because you have love for one another. Are you growing in love? 
If you are as mean today as you were when you got saved, you're not growing. If you're impatient today, just like you were yesterday, you're not growing. God wants us to grow. Are you still dreaming? Listen, how many times in the news do you see somebody 70 went back to school and got a degree? Somebody 65 is pumping waist and, and having a body looking like a 45-year-old. Are you still dreaming? Are you still making plans for life? Are you still coming out making goals? You should. You should. Are you sharing your faith with others? Because if you if growth will suggest that I'm I'm reaching forward, that somebody's mentoring me, that somebody's helping me, that somebody's teaching me, but also I'm reaching back, that I'm mentoring somebody, I'm teaching somebody, I'm helping somebody, I'm bringing somebody alongside of me. I've got to help somebody else. I'm giving, I'm kind. So these are some scriptures to help us to grow. First Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away a childish things. At some point, you should put away the stuff that you used to do. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand toe to toe, chest to chest with you talking, you know, fussing and cussing each other out like this for housewives. I'm not doing that. I'm a grown woman. I can't make you think what I want you to think and act the way I want you to act. Either you do or you don't. Either we get along or we don't. I'm going to love you just the same. You go your way and I'll go mine. I'm not going to be fighting. Now, we, we can have honest debate, mature discussion. Come on, y'all. But we're not fighting, calling each other out of our names. Who, who's still doing that? 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. 1 Corinthians 2 and 6 says, yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Paul talks about sharing wisdom with people who have a godly mind, who have kingdom mindset, wisdom that comes from above. The Bible says there's, a, there's the wisdom of this world is sensual, it's evil, it's devilish, but the wisdom from above is from God, it's peaceable. Come on, y'all. The wisdom from above is profitable. 1 Corinthians 3 and 8 says, he who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. So as I grow, I understand the value of working. I understand the value of, of, of earning. I understand the value of, of understanding that, yeah, I'm responsible for feeding me, not somebody else. And that, and that whatever I sow, that I'm going to reap that very same thing. That God won't be unrighteous to forget my work and my labor of love. If I work, the Lord's going to bless the fruit of my hand. So stop complaining, but I can't get ahead. You can work at Burger King and have a good life. I don't care what people tell you. You can work at Burger King and learn how to manage your money, and you can get along just fine. Because there's some people who got a whole lot of money who living in hell, who don't have peace. Hello, somebody. So God is able to make all grace abound toward me. So that, so that he will bless the works of my hand. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. We talk about the scriptures that will help us grow. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1 says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's what Paul told the church, the, told the church of Corinth. Follow me as I follow Christ. He was What he was saying is, when I'm doing what Christ wants me to do, then imitate that. Now, if I, if I slip and I do something that's, that's in the flesh, ignore that. But as I follow Christ, as I show you a God example, be imitators of that. Emulate that. Do the same. Understand that my life is to be an example for somebody else, to be an example for somebody else. God wants me to show other people how to walk godly in this world, to be in the world but not of the world. We got to grow up because if people can't look at me and see that I'm a child of God because of how I live, because of my decisions, because of my word, because of my works, then I'm not growing. And Peter Pan said, I won't grow up because I don't want to learn to, to tie a tie. I don't want to learn how to pinch a penny. You know? So come on. Growth suggests that I learn some adult things 
that I learned to adult. I act like an adult. First Thessalonians, when I'm done, 3 and 12 says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Don't just love your kind. Don't just love the black woman. I don't just love women. I love white men. I love Japs. I love coming out Hispanics. I love gays. I love coming out pansexuals. I love homosexuals. I love lesbians. Come on, y'all. I love the, come on, our skinheads. I love. Because if, if I'm born of God, who is love, then I, I don't love what they do, but I love them. Why? Because God created them in his image after his likeness, just like he created me. Amen. So by just the way I'm not perfect, God loves me. I've got to learn to love other people with it, even in their imperfections. Second Peter, we talked about, I don't want to be Peter Pan, but I want to be like the Apostle Peter who talked too much, who talked out of turn. The Apostle Peter, but he learned, he learned how to grow in God so much so that God used him to preach one sermon and thousands were saved. The same man who talked too much like Peter Pan, one day he got filled with the Holy Ghost and he matured. He began to grow up in God. 2 Peter 3 and 18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. So Peter says, we've got to grow up. Grow up. God gives us the grace to grow up. Stop wanting God's gifts just to be big or gifts to prosper. You ought to want God's grace to grow, grace to love, grace to forgive, grace to live right, grace to live holy, grace to talk holy, grace to have holy thoughts. Philippians 1 and 6 says, and I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion to the day of Jesus Christ. God is not through with me. God is not through with me and God is not through with you. And so we, we keep growing. We keep, we, we count seconds, we count minutes, we count hours, we count days, we count weeks, we count months, we count years, we count decades, we count centuries. But how do you count your growth spiritually? How do you see how you're growing spiritually? The Bible says, he which has begun a good work in you shall perform to the day of Jesus Christ. Can I submit to you today, the same way we throw ourselves birthday parties, we should throw ourselves an introspection party where nobody is included but me, where I spend some time in the presence of God and I honestly vow, I, I honestly look at my life. I honestly look at my growth or I invite other people in to be honest with me, to be open with me, to be truthful with me, to be blunt with me, to be forthright with me and to talk to me about how do, how do they see me growing spiritually or if they indeed see me growing spiritually at all. We got to do that. And don't get upset with somebody saying, well, you should be better than that or you should, you don't need to keep doing that. Listen. Listen, because the greatest room in the world is the room for improvement. We all can improve. We all have room to grow. Colossians 1 and 10 says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Because we're children of God every day, we should want to increase in the knowledge of God. Every day we should read this word so that we can learn more and more about God, learn more and more about God's ways because he wants us to be like him. And there's no way I'm going to be like him if I don't know him. The Bible says, Paul says, oh, to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship, fellowship of his suffering. That's what we ought to want. We ought to want to know Jesus. Suffer like he suffered. Amen, somebody. Because if I suffer like he suffered, then I reign like he's reigning. And Peter says, like newborn infants, we have to long for the pure spiritual milk that by it we may grow up into salvation. That the word of God is my spiritual food to help me grow. That I don't, I don't just say I'm saved, but every year you can see that I'm growing, that I'm growing, that I'm becoming better, that I'm looking more and more like Christ. I'm going to make this testimony real short. My father was killed when I was about two or three years old. My paternal grandmother told me, be careful what you pray for. She said, because I, yeah, I loved your daddy 
Like, yo, he was, my son was smart. He was handsome, but he gave me hell. And I pray, Lord, take away my trouble. She said, I prayed that prayer on a Sunday and on a Tuesday. I got a call from a woman who said, come pick up your son. He hit it for the last time while he was asleep. She put five bullets in his back, murdered my father. I had never seen my father stand up. I have one image of my father, his, his picture in a frame. And I have one member of my father uh, sitting in my great auntie's house. And I remember sitting on his lap and talking to him. But I've never seen my father stand up. Don't know how tall he was. None of that. I, I only know what my mother told me about my father. I only know what my grandmother before she died, what she told me about my father. But I didn't know him. I didn't know him, you could say personally, because I was only two when he died. But about 10 years ago, when I was teaching a Bible study at my former church, one of the senior members walked up to me. She said, are you Lucia Kirkendall's granddaughter, the one she brags about all the time? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, I should have known. She said, because you walk just like your daddy. Girl, you walk just like Raymond. <laughs> so she said, I had never seen it. Stand up, didn't know how tall I was, had never seen him walk. I only had one member of me sitting on his lap. I only know what people told me about him. I only have one image. But she said, you walk just like your daddy. And that's what God wants from all of us. He wants us to walk just like our father. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, how we thank you for this time that we've had to share in the study of your word. Although I've interjected many very practical and natural things, Lord God, it was taken and extracted, uh, extracted from your word so that we can use it as examples and help for tools for our everyday living. Help us, Lord God, to apply your word to our life so that we're not just growing old, but we're growing up. We're learning to be kind. We're learning to develop a thick skin. We're learning to assert ourselves. We're learning to move beyond ourselves to help somebody else. We're learning to love ourselves and to see ourselves the way you see us. We're learning to have a healthy self-esteem for our uh, for ourselves and love for ourselves so that we also can love others and hold them in high esteem. Your word says to high, to hold them higher than ourselves. And so we thank you, Lord God, that you're just teaching us about love. You're teaching us about humility. You're teaching us about unity. You're teaching us about how to love others the way you love us, Father. We pray tonight that you have um, shared something through my lips that will help us, that would impact us, that would uh, transform our thinking and hopefully help us to live a better life so that when people see us, they see you. Unlike Peter Pan, we want to grow up. And we want to be conformed to the image of your son so that your word will be true when your word says, what man of love the father has bestowed upon us. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we should be just like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has his hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. Help us, Lord God, to continue to purify ourselves because we long for the day. We wait for the day. We look for the day when we will see you face to face. We love you. We thank you. We pray this prayer by faith in your darling son, Jesus' name. Amen. And thank God. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. I know I probably went over really long, but this is the last lesson in I won't grow up. I won't grow up. I would never even try in the Peter Pan syndrome, getting over the Peter Pan syndrome so we can grow up to be who Christ wants us to be, grow in knowledge, grow in discernment, grow in repentance, grow in boldness. Come on, y'all. Grow up, grow in obedience, grow in power, grow in humility. Somebody said, grow up, grow. We won't be like spoiled children or, or, or children who just stuck, stuck. We're growing up. We're growing up in him. God bless you. And I can't wait to see you tomorrow night. For our first lesson of the month of December, the greatest gift at Christmas. God bless you. Have a good night.